Let's prepare our hearts for worship together. Uh, hopefully we've been already worshiping today and through uh, this previous week in our daily lives. But let's uh, join our hearts together in song as we worship and praise the Ancient of Days.
have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me in your copy of God's Word to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 56 and through verse 58. God's Word says this. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let's pray together. Father, we, with all we are, give you thanks and praise you today, the God who gives our lives meaning you have given victory over our sin over our sins consequences and the hopelessness that we have in sin we have victory over those things through jesus jesus has done what we were helpless to do to fulfill your law to live it out perfectly and he died in our place and father you have given us eyes to see it and believe it And we praise you for helping us see. We praise you, God, that that knowing this, we know that our lives lived for you matter eternally. You have shown us that what we do here has eternal meaning, eternal consequences, and that it matters in our lives and in the lives of those around us. So, Father, we praise you today, and we confess we want every aspect of our lives to be a fragrant aroma, a sacrifice of praise to you. And so we pray that you would hear our hearts of praise today in our worship. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. If you are visiting, we have connect cards on the seats in front of you. We would love to uh, learn a little bit more about you, let you know about our church family. If you have prayer requests, you can fill that out as well. And you can just drop those cards in the offering box on your way out. Uh, A few announcements to be made aware of. All our announcements are in the bulletin. But a few things just to take note of. Next Sunday is our next church family meeting. So every couple months we have a church family meeting for members. And we hear updates uh, on ministry and ways that we can be praying for one another. Share praises and how God has worked through our church family. And so we're going to be doing that next Sunday evening. And uh, we're going to have a meal right after that, that meeting. And so it's going to be kind of a potluck-style meal. So the church will be providing meat. We ask that you all bring sides. And then the youth, we're asking to bring desserts. And then we're taking donations for desserts to help uh, offset some of the costs for youth camp. And so uh, make note of that. We would love for for you all to join us uh, for a time of just hearing what God is doing. And then also uh, just celebrating and having a meal together. Uh, Today is the end of the semester for our youth group. Uh, So they're going to have a, a... pizza slash pool party right after church at the Linden's house uh, today. So I hope the youth, middle school and high school students can make that. Um, If you would like to give uh, to support the work of the church, you can give online or you can drop it in the offering box on the way out. Uh, Also, if you'd like to give to to sponsor a a student for camp, you can, there's still time to sponsor a student to be able to go to camp as well. And just check your bulletin for those announcements. But also want to mention we are going to be doing the Lord's Supper at the end of the service. So if you didn't pick up uh, the elements when you came in, there should be some out in the foyer that you can pick up uh, before we get to that time of the service. So let's stand and continue singing together.
what my heart will choose to say. Blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. But my heart will choose to say. Lord, blessed be your name. Your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. Celebrated church.
God, you reign. Amen. Open again your copy of God's Word to Colossians chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 23 and 24. Colossians 2, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done from the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we gather before your throne this morning to praise you, thankful that we have the privilege to come before you with our confessions and our petitions. You are creator and we are your creation. You're timeless, and we're bound in time you created for us. You're all-knowing, and by comparison, we are dullards. You're righteous, and apart from a saving relationship with Christ, we're not. We confess your greatness and our smallness with our tongues, but in reality, too often we think too little of you and too much of ourselves, our lives, our decisions, our actions, our desires, our affections are all plagued by our sinful nature. While you have called us to be your own for your glory and for our good, we're prone to seek glory for ourselves and hope you're good with it. You've told us what is best for us. You've given us your word written down in the Bible. You have sent your son to die for us and to model righteousness for us. You have given us salvation and gathered us a safe harbor so that we might grow to be more like our Savior. We're surrounded by a society that believes we can declare anything to be true about ourselves and others must be forced to celebrate. As Christians, we condemn that society and then we do our own thing, make our own choices, live how we want, thumbing our noses at your ways. And then we're shocked to see how bad the outcomes are for us. We're shocked when you discipline us. We're dismayed when others don't applaud our choices. We're disappointed when we aren't happy. At times, we even act like we're the center of the universe. And then you show us how short our lives are, how little will will be remembered about us when we die, how little impact we have on the world when we make everything about ourselves. Forgive us, Father. Teach us your word through our gathering this morning, through the sermon, through our fellowship, through our giving, through our singing. Give us a heart for you and your desires. Help us to balance the truth that in the universe, we're mere specks that seem to measure up as nothing, and the truth that we are actually made in your image and likeness, that you love us and demonstrated that love by sending your Son to be sin for us, to die for us, to take your wrath for us. Give us a vision of your kingdom, a compassion for the lost, a desire to help everyone here to be more Christ-like, even before we leave this gathering this morning. We pray these things for the sake and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. A new song for here us here at Safe Harbor, not a new song by any means, but
Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Praise with Him to endless life. He will hold me fast till our faith is turned. Let's turn our hearts and and minds once again to the reading of God's word. We'll be reading from the book of Ecclesiastes or Ecclesiastes. Starting at chapter one, verses one through eleven. You can follow along with your Bibles or the screens to the left and right. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Absolute futility says the teacher, absolute futility, everything is futile. What does a person gain for all his efforts that he labors at under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets, panting, it returns to the place where it rises. Gusting to the south, turning to the north, turning, turning, goes the wind, And the wind returns and it cycles. All the streams flow to the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome, more than anyone can say. The eye is not satisfied by seeing or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Can one say about anything, look, this is new? It has already existed in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of those who come before. And of those who will come after, there will also be no remembrance by those who follow them. Heavenly Father, King of the universe, You are eternal. Lord Jesus Christ, Messiah, God with us, you are eternal. Your Holy Spirit is eternal. Dwelling in us, your believers. The workings of this world are futile, Lord. We know that. Those who have put our faith in you. Lord, help us to be reminded this morning that our hope is not in this futile world and these futile comings and goings. And that there will always be wars and rumors of wars as long as life continues in this earthly fashion. But Lord, help us to realize that our home is not here. Residence is with you in heaven. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you gird up the folks here, the folks that will hear this word, hear your word preached. Help us to find our strength in you. For you're the only true strength, Lord. Lord, I lift up Pastor Andy as he brings a message from your word this morning. Pray you give him clarity of thought, anointing of your Holy Spirit to preach in power and in truth. 
And I pray that our hearts would receive it well and you would be glorified and your church would be edified. And we ask and pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Would you please be seated? At this time, the kids can make their way downstairs uh, to your classes and follow your teachers out the back door, or you're welcome to stay here as well. Leave your Bibles open to Ecclesiastes, and I'm looking forward to, to starting this book together today. It's an interesting book. It's a book a lot of people don't read because they find it depressing <laughs> or confusing, and yet it is God's Word and profitable when we really understand what God wants us to see in His Word. Most of you uh, here today probably know who Tom Brady is. Uh, if you've watched football at all, Tom Brady is a Super Bowl winning quarterback, MVP. And he, it's estimated that in his career over the last 20 seasons, he's made over $235 million. He has a beautiful family, wife, kids. About 12 years ago, after winning multiple Super Bowls, he'd, he'd already experienced great success. He sat down for an interview uh, uh, with uh, 60 Minutes. And in that interview, in spite of all his money and his achievements and his fame, he, he conveyed that he still felt empty. Here's what he said. A lot of times I think I get very frustrated. And there's times where I'm not the person that I want to be. I have su three Super Bowl rings. A lot of people would say, hey, this is, this is what it's all about. I reached my goal, my dream, my life, but I think there's got to be something more than this. Ten years later, just a couple years ago, Brady was asked the same question, and he had the same answer. When the interviewer asked Brady, he said, what's the answer to, to this longing for something more? And Brady said, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. And he still had the same answer just a couple years ago, after more success, more money. Now, I would guess that those of us in this room probably haven't accomplished athletically what he has accomplished. But we probably feel like we've made some progress in our life. We've done some pretty cool things, had some good experiences, or maybe you've just come a long way from where you started in life. But looking at our lives, we have to ask ourselves, is what I have done, is what I have seen, what I have accomplished, will it really mean that much in the end? There's a book in the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes, that wrestles with that same question. Is there something more? Is there something more meaningful? Something more lasting? And really, deep down, that's a question every single one of us, every person wants to know. I mean, there are people all around us today, if we're Christians, we need to recognize there's people all around us in the world, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, that are asking that question. They're wondering, is there something more to life? In our passage today, first of all, it tells us that is a legitimate question to ask. Here we see in the Bible that question, a follower of God asking that question. And what he wants us to know is God has the answer we're looking for. Which brings us to the, the big truth of our passage today as we start the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's this, lasting fulfillment and meaning cannot be found in a merely human understanding of life. Lasting fulfillment and meaning cannot be found in a merely human understanding of life. So maybe you're at a point in your life, maybe you're in high school or college, thinking about what's ahead you're wondering, what am I going to do with my life that's going to matter? Or maybe you're further along in life and you're looking back, what have I done that has mattered? And I don't want to just waste my life the rest of my time. The book of Ecclesiastes helps us think through these things. You know, verses 1 through 2 here in this passage that we just read really serve as an introduction to the whole book. 
of Ecclesiastes. Let me read those for us and just explain what the book's really all about. Verse 1, the words of the teacher, the son of David, king of or king in Jerusalem. Now, most people think Solomon is the writer of Ecclesiastes. There's a few people who think it could be another descendant after Solomon, but most people would say it's Solomon. If you know anything about Solomon, he was, after David, probably the greatest king in the nation of Israel. He lived about a thousand years before Jesus, did a lot of amazing things. He was the Tom Brady of Israel's kings. And he famously is known for asking God. He could have asked God for anything in the world, and he asked God for wisdom. And so we believe he's perhaps the white, apart from Jesus, perhaps the wisest man who has ever lived. And how does this wise man assess life? We come to verse 2 and read it. It's really encouraging. Absolute futility, says the teacher. Absolute futility, everything is futile. Other translations translate this word vanity. Everything is vanity or meaningless or empty. The Hebrew word there is literally, literally means a breath or a vapor. Everything's just a breath. I think there's an illustration I heard that ca- captures this thought well. Think, think about a match. You strike a match and you blow it out, what happens? What do you see? You see a puff of smoke, right, come out of the match. You can see that smoke. You can smell it. It's there. But then it goes away. It drifts away. And what what happens if you try to grab that puff of smoke? It makes it go away faster. It's out of your reach. Well, life is like that. What we see, what we hear, what we taste that seem to give meaning, are real, but they're fleeting. We can't hold on to it. We can't keep these things. It's like grasping at the wind, and we're just left with a feeling of emptiness, a feeling of loss. Even in the the greatest joys, they don't last. And we find ourselves longing for that feeling again. At times, it, it can seem like in our lives, our life feels empty or meaningless. Maybe some of us came this morning feeling that way about our lives. And uh, we, we ask ourselves, is anything I'm doing really making that big of a difference? Really? What, can, what did I accomplish today or this week that has lasting meaning? Or am I just living for the moment? So we have to ask ourselves, well, is this how God wants us to live? This feeling of emptiness all the time? Is that what God wants for me? Is that what he wants for you? Or does he have something more for us? And I think we all would hope there's something more. But the question is, well, what is that? What is it? And where can we find it? And that's what the book of Ecclesiastes seeks to answer. It helps, seeks to help us find, really. But to get to the answer, we have to go on a journey. And the, the book of Ecclesiastes, the writer, takes us really on a journey through life. And we come to all these different rocks of life, and we turn over those rocks and see if what's underneath that rock is what's going to give us meaning. And then we go on to the next rock. And that's what we're going to see as we work our way through the book of Ecclesiastes. We're just going to be turning over things. Is that where it's at? Is that where life is? Is that, is that what's going to help me? And so we're really just going to be going on a journey through the things that we look at in life for meaning. But today we're, we're going to start that journey. And to, when we start a journey, think of it like a scavenger hunt. When you start a scavenger hunt, you're trying to find what you're looking for, right? And so we need to know what we're looking for. And the book of Ecclesiastes really highlights two big things that we are looking for, two truths that we can look for to find meaning in life. First, we can look for something that is truly gain for us, that helps us really move forward and advance. That's the first thing. Second, something that's lasting, that doesn't just go away. So those are our two points. So first, we need to look for something 
at his true gain. Verse 2, again, it says that life is futile or vanity. Again, literally a breath, a vapor that disappears, not satisfying. You know, it's a natural tendency for us in life, for, for people in life, to try to find meaning and identity to feel like we are, are meaningful. And may, maybe it's something we have accomplished in life. Think about how conversations go. We try to really find meaning through our conversations, right? So one of the first things that people often ask someone is, what do you do? Like, what you do makes you meaningful. And if we're honest, if we do something important, if we have a job that we feel like is really important, or if we have an accomplishment, something we've done that we feel like is really a big accomplishment, we like people to know it. So we tell them. And Facebook and Instagram prove this. And we like to think we have, we all like to think we have accomplished great things in life, made great gains. And then we come to the book of Ecclesiastes for perspective. Look at verse 3. What does a person gain for all his effort that he labors at under the sun? That phrase, under the sun, is a really important phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's used 30 times throughout the book. It's not used anywhere else in the Bible. But it's repeated over and over again. So what does under the sun mean? Well, essentially it means human life apart from God. Just human life day in, day out, the things we're going through uh, as people. Just living life as people without God intervening. Living for the here and now only is what it means to live life under the sun. So the question he is asking here is what do we really gain if we are living for the here and now only? If we are living for human achievements. And the most honest answer we have to say is, well, apart from God, we don't really gain anything from all our efforts and labor. We may get temporary enjoyment or satisfaction, but it doesn't last. And we are left wanting something more. And the Bible helps us understand why this is true. Genesis 3, if we go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible tells us of the fall of man, where Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sin entered the world, and it resulted in a curse in life that made our work futile. Look at, let me read verse 17 through 19. And God said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. The Bible tells us why right there. Life can be so frustrating. We see this painful, sweat-filled effort just to live, just to eat, put food on the table, and survive. And then it's all gone. We return to the ground. There is a futility, a vanity in our efforts that we see is a direct result of sin in our world and in our lives. We put in the effort, we don't really get, make any gain, and we end up where we started, in the ground. So why did this teacher in Ecclesiastes write this message to Israel? Why is he telling them all this? Well, we need to realize he's writing to a people, a a nation, who is starting to see real progress. King Solomon, if you know anything about the time that he ruled over Israel, they really made some great advancements as a nation. They, They built a huge temple. They were very wealthy. And so they're seeing this with their eyes. Wow, we are becoming a nation that can compete with the best of them. And what, uh, and and Solomon, you know, you can imagine him getting prideful about all his accomplishments. 
their, their nation state is advancing, but the writer here is trying to present a stark reality to them. All the progress they see, all the things they seem to be thinking highly of themselves as a nation about and working for, those things won't satisfy them, and they won't last. And so the goal here then is to warn Israel that don't put your hope in human achievements. No matter how amazing they may be, apart from God, from God they're not going to be real gain. They won't satisfy. You know, I, I'm the type of person, if you know me, I love to be able to do things and then see and enjoy the results of what I've done. Uh, so I, I like to have a, a sense of reward for my hard work that I can enjoy and see, personally see. So this is why I enjoy landscaping, right? I can do, do some landscaping, see and enjoy the, the flowers and the, the mulch and that kind of stuff. Uh, or this is why I enjoy gardening, right? I can plant a garden and enjoy the fruits of the garden. Or when I was an engineer, it was, there was a satisfaction I had when I could go into UK hospital and look and see there's an air conditioning unit I designed. Now, some of you all are like, that's, what are you talking about, right? But I, I, there was satisfaction. It works. What I designed works. And I get to enjoy it, and I'm not hot. But guess what? That HVA system, HVAC system I designed, it's going to wear out. It's going to have to be replaced. That landscaping that I worked so hard on to get looking just right, it's going to have weeds that are going to come up, and I'm going to have to pull them, and I'm going to sweat. That garden that I planted, it's going to last for a season, then I'm going to have to pull it all up and plant it again. All that effort I put in, while there's a season of enjoyment, looks good, feels good, doesn't last. And to be honest, those things don't change someone's life forever. So what should we do? What, what, should, what should we do with this? Should we just give up, sit at home, do nothing? Well, ultimately, the teacher writing this to us here in Ecclesiastes wants to help us see what is not real gain, in order to help us discover what is real gain. To take our eyes from looking in this direction so that we look in another direction. God is calling us to look somewhere outside ourselves and what we are doing for gain. We have to look outside of our understanding of life, our human abilities, what we value. We have to look to God. And this requires patience. We see right here at the beginning of Ecclesiastes, this whole book, this writer is intending to train us, to teach us, to wait on God to produce real gain in life. And to trust him to do it. And the Bible defines for us what true gain is. We're not left wondering. The Bible helps us see it. It's not a great invention. It's not a beautiful creation or anything we can do or say that magnifies our own importance. The Bible teaches us that the true gain we seek doesn't exist under the sun. But Paul specifically tells us what true gain is. Philippians 3, verses 7 through 8. But everything that was a gain to me, everything under the sun, everything that was a gain, I have considered a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ. What was Paul's idea of true gain? Christ. Knowing Christ as my Lord. Your longing for meaning, your longing for real gain exists. It's real. Because there is a place in your soul that can only be filled by knowing Christ and his presence in your life. Do you want to know what it means to be satisfied? 
to feel like you have truly gained what you've been missing. Here it is, Matthew 5, 6. Jesus says this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. There it is, this, this longing, right, for meaning. This emptiness, hungering, thirsting for righteousness. For they will be filled. And recognize that futility, that feeling that you have of longing is actually a longing and a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And Christ is our righteousness. And he will meet and satisfy and fill you. For you can't be righteous and fill that emptiness yourself. The search for meaning starts with knowing the kind of gain you are looking for. But we also see we have to look for something that lasts. We need to know what kind of gain we're trying to make. We want to find something that lasts. Life, again, is vanity. It's a breath, a vapor. In a vapor, a breath doesn't last. It just drifts off into the air. And this goes against our desire to do something that will be remembered. Right? We, we want to do something that makes a lasting difference. To be remembered forever because of who we are and what we've done. And the writer puts this into perspective as he compares our lives to the earth and to creation. Look at verse 4. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets. Panting, it hurries back to the place where it rises. Gusting to the south, turning to the north, turning, turning, goes the wind. And the wind returns and it cycles. All the streams flow to the sea. Yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. Do you see the picture here? The sun, the wind, the streams, the seas of the earth will all outlast our lives. And this is meant to cause us to consider the short length of your life and my life compared to the length of the earth which continues on. Look at the sun as it shines. We can see the sun coming through the window. The su if, if you could look at the sun right now, imagine that's the same sun that Adam and Eve looked at. Or consider the Jordan River in Israel. That river has seen the likes of Moses. You can get in that today, right? You can get in the river. Seen the likes of Moses and Joshua and David, John the Baptist, Jesus himself has been in that river. They're gone. The river's still there. The point is this. When we die, the sun's going to rise the next morning. The waters will tide, the wind will blow, and people after us will come. And they'll take their turn, and then they'll go too. The verses say that generations come and go. This reminds us, having family, having parents, having children are good things, but they don't last either. And they're not going to satisfy us and give us ultimate meaning in life. So our worst and our best days fade. Our celebrations and our tragedies disappear. And it comforts us, in a, in a way, to know that our pain will not last forever. That's a comforting truth. But it also leaves a longing, knowing that our earthly successes and joys also don't last forever. So what does the writer feel about all this? In one word, weary. Look at verse 8. All things are wearisome. More than anyone can say, the eye is not satisfied by seeing or the ear, or the ear filled with hearing. And some of you all today, I'm just weary with life. And the writer of Ecclesiastes says, me too. And we feel this. What we work for, the feelings of joy, they don't seem to last. And we become weary. And all this is old news. According to the teacher, the weariness is the same old story of every human being in every time and every place. Verse 9, what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. 
can one say about anything? Look, this is new. It has already existed in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of those who came before and of those who will come after. There will also be no remembrance by those who follow them. Life just seems like one big treadmill. And then in verse 11, we are eventually forgotten. And we know that's going to be true, if we're really honest. How many of you today can even name all of your great-grandparents, much less tell me something about what they did? Human life, human experience, it, while it matters now, it doesn't last forever. So why does the writer seem to want to rain on our parade? Hey, I just want to go on with my life and have fun. It's about how short life is. Ultimately, God wants to help us see what is not lasting to help us find what is lasting. And we hear a hint in this passage of where to look for something that lasts. The lasting nature, nat nature of creation points us to a lasting creator. And if there's a creator who is lasting, who is eternal, then maybe he has something for us, his creation, to know and live for that is lasting. Something worth remembering. Something po worth pouring out our lives for. For real meaning. And this lasting life comes with Jesus. God does do something new. God does something new that has never happened before. And what is this new thing? Jesus, the eternal Son of God, leaves heaven and enters this world. Something no human can do. Jesus comes and he promises through his life and death and resurrection to make all things new a new creation that lasts forever that's that's new and he brings truth that's new and life that's new and he says this about the truth he brings in john 8 31 through 32 if you continue in my word you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free not emptiness, not meaningless, is free to live. And he says this about life, John 10, 10. I came that you may have life and have it, not in vain, abundantly. Jesus came and offers something completely new, a new birth that brings you into a new kingdom, the kingdom of God, and he conquers death. That's new. No human can conquer death. So his kingdom, this, this life that he invites you to, is the only thing that lasts. If you want to invest your life in something that lasts, it's his kingdom. It's his work. He defeated death. He rose from the dead to prove that his life lasts. It's eternal. His work lasts. So when you join yourself to Jesus by faith, you inherit a promise. Re Revelation 21.5. See, I am making all things new. When you join yourself to Jesus, you become a part of that. The work that he is doing, you are joining yourself to, to bring newness to the world, to people. You inherit that. This is how we see life with eyes of hope. God is doing something new in my life, through me. And it lasts, but we have to give ourselves to him. We have to make that decision initially. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe you have never given yourself to Jesus, and so you have no hope that God's going to do anything new in your life. God does something new in your life when you give your life to him through repentance and faith. 
You have to stop living for yourself and live for the Savior. And then you have to continually give your life to Jesus, ongoing repentance. And he'll continue to, continue to do new things as you look to him. Giving yourself to Jesus means you are joining in God's work in this world and new things he is doing, new realities with an unshakable hope that God will make all things new and it will be forever. So today realize one of the ways that God leads us to know him is that he helps us pay attention to ourselves. He reveals himself by helping us see our humanity. He shows us what we were made for and then causes us to look at what has become of us. In Ecclesiastes, God intends you to know him by requiring you to look plainly and honestly at yourself, your neighbors, and the world in which you and I live. And as we look at our lives and the people around us and we see our longings and our needs in some level of emptiness, we will be brought to contemplate the good things of God in Christ. The king writing this book refers to himself as a son of David. That's not an accident. By simply putting that phrase, son of David, in that sentence at the beginning of this book, he is pointing Israel to one who is greater than Solomon, the son of David, the true son of David, who is coming to crush all the disappointments we feel in life, all the futility of our efforts, all the temporary things, to remove that feeling forever and to bring lasting life, fulfilling life. He's holding out this promise of God to his people that the emptiness we feel is not forever when we are in Christ. We have to join ourselves to him. He gives us life and contentment. Our longing for meeting, your longing for something more, something better, something lasting exists because there is a place in your soul that can only be filled by Jesus Christ. So let him fill it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, for the reality that it helps us to see that the world is in. Father, you are good to show us these things and help us to take seriously your word which calls us to consider life, consider what we are living for, what we're searching for so that we might look to you, God, earnestly. Look to you. Make it our mission, our life, to look to you. Father, put that in our hearts today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today, maybe some of you all here, God is putting in your heart what we see only God can fill. And if you don't know Jesus, that is the way. And I would love to talk with you afterward about how you can know this God who fills our lives in the emptiness. But let's stand and we're going to sing and respond and consider our God who meets us in our need, in our emptiness, and fills us with his life, with his joy, and his presence. Let's sing.
May be seated as we continue worshiping our great and faithful God. We're going to take a moment to observe the Lord's Supper together. You know, as Christians, God calls us, commands us to live lives mindful of the cross and his resurrection and what Christ has accomplished on our behalf for our sins so that we might be forgiven and we might live. So as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, we want to remember the symbolism of the cup and the bread. The bread represents the body of Christ, which is broken for us. How Christ bore our punishment, took God's wrath that was intended for us on himself in our sin so that we might be declared righteous and innocent. The cup, the blood of Christ, <clears throat> which symbolizes his purchase of our forgiveness, the covenant that God joins himself to us as forgiven sinners through the blood of Christ. 
God has brought you, if you are a follower of Jesus, into fellowship with him through what Christ has done. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that as we take the Lord's Supper together, we proclaim the Lord's death. We celebrate what God has done until he returns. And we are proclaiming the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves, Jesus forgives as we eat and as we drink. And so we want to prepare ourselves. Do I believe that? Do I believe I need forgiveness? Do I believe that Christ does it on the cross? And he's the only way that we can be forgiven. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, whenever eating the bread and drinking the cup of the Lord, we should examine ourselves. So examine yourself today. Are you in the faith? First of all, the Lord's Supper is for Christians, people who believe Jesus did these things for us. And we are living for him as our Lord, repenting of sin, following, following him. Lord's Supper is a time to examine our hearts. In what ways are we disobeying God that we need to confess? The Lord's Supper is for baptized believers, people who have obeyed Christ through baptism and are obeying him in other ways and not withholding any obedience from Christ. If you haven't been baptized, I encourage you, take that step of obedience. God calls us to it. So I want to invite anyone here who is a follower of Jesus, who has publicly professed faith in Christ through baptism, to join us as we remember Christ, celebrate Christ, Together as his people, we do this as a body of believers together because he has united us. His blood is what brings us here together and makes us a people. With all our differences, he makes us one. So we're going to take just a moment and pray together individually. I'll close us out in prayer and then we'll take the elements together as a church. Let's pray. Father, we humbly come before you, thankful that you have not left us in our sin, not left us to the consequences of our sins forever, but you have sent your Son for our forgiveness and our life. We praise you. You are a God who loves us this deeply. Lord, put it in our hearts to love you, to be your people, and to love one another because you first loved us, to forgive others because you have forgiven us. And we know what it is. We thank you that you have made us people under your name. And we commit our lives to you yet again as we remember Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First, Jesus took the bread. You peel off the top part of your cup. Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, 
Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Matthew records that before they left the upper room and went to the Mount of Olives that they sang a hymn. So would you stand and let's sing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a great rest of your day.